I am Brian Davis, the Residency Program Director at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center of El Paso, and I'm also a member of the Society of Surgery of the Elementary Tract Committee on Resident Education. I'm very privileged to be here with my mentor of eight years, Dr. Richard McCallum. Richard McCallum graduated from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, and has had a distinguished career in gastroenterology. He started his academic career at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, became faculty at Yale in New Haven, Connecticut, progressed on to University of Virginia, uh, had great success also at University of Kansas, and came to El Paso as the founding chair of internal medicine, and is a world expert in gastroparesis and many other idiopathic gastrointestinal diseases. Thank you so much, Dr. McCallum, for agreeing to interview and discuss with residents the important collaboration with GI and with senior mentors in your academic development career. To start off with our first question, you really have tackled some of the hardest diseases in gastroenterology. They're really almost orphan diseases. Can you discuss how it really helped shape your career to pick the hardest problems in the field? Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Davis, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, colleagues. Uh, hello to you. And yes, um, that happens to a lot of us in the clinical world as we enter our academic careers. We encounter um, challenges, uh, maybe in our fellowship, our training. Somehow gastroparesis came on the radar for me. Uh, one interesting thing in academics, it's a wide open space. That always uh, stimulates interest, right? The competition wasn't great. Uh, a lot of work to look after the patients, a lot of unknown questions, unmet needs. But let's look at it subjectively or from the some sort of eyes of the beholder, Brian. Um, Sprue or celiac disease is 1% of the world's population. Hepatitis C that gets endless press is 2 to 3%. Uh, gastroparesis is 3 or 4%. Uh, over 10 million people in this country. So we're looking at a, um, an entity which has uh, got a lot under the surface from diabetic, idiopathic, connective tissue, post-vagotomy in your world. And so when you uncover the blankets, it's really a little bit more pervasive uh, than we think it is. And in general, uh, I would say it wasn't I went out and looked up the book, What's Rare? Uh, it came my way many, many times as a junior faculty, uh, even as a fellow, and I figured out from my own faculty that meant it me. You know, this is an unmet need. You could really think about going to this area and making contributions. Excellent answer, thank you. Um, for another question, you really started out at some very luminary places, especially with uh, UCLA and then uh, going to the Ivy League at Yale. Yeah. Can you see some real benefits? There's a real need for people with skill in the underserved community. Can you see some advantages for surgeons starting the career in an underserved community like we have here in El Paso? Good question, Brian. So I came from Australia um, and I, I wanted to also learn the real deal in this country. I wanted to go to the places that had been leaders that produced some of the great um, physicians of the country, the, the great leaders and names that I heard about growing up. So, and I also wanted to get my academic foundation. You know, I grew up in a different academic world in Australia. I came here to sort of get, get the gospel, you know, how, how to survive an academic life, get the foundation, find out how I'm going to evolve myself. So I felt I needed to go to some pretty well-rounded and established and, and really great reputation places. So that's how uh, UCLA and Yale evolved. Also, there's some good luck. I was interviewed and accepted. So I would say that helped me get a strong foundation of where I could then build and expand my vision. Coming to a El Paso type Texas Tech border, if you like, medical school, which was the first on the border when you and I came around 2009 time frame, you've got a mental state where I'm going to stay, put down some uh, roots here, be a pioneer, build and stay. I, I'm sort of the, I'm a ground level. Uh, I was coming up the ladder in a way. I could see Yale being a stepping stone. Leaving Yale is not a bad ticket to have. I'm going to go on to something else if you so desire. Here you'd have to spend your 10 or 15 years establishing your program, being very satisfied 
that you have left a legacy. You've left the Brian Davis stamp. You've set the bar, you've set a standard. And then maybe later, after you've met some of your goals and feel satisfied in your academic and clinical career, your reputation will be such that, gee, I might want to look at other potential opportunities. But I'm here to set down my roots and in doing that, I would have to be willing to go to some courses, uh, visit other centers, have a wide network, because I need to develop my own skills, but I don't want to make mistakes doing it. I need to have good instruction, good advice, how to evolve and maintain myself at this level. Whereas at a Yale, UCLA level, I could meet people in the hallway any day that were you know, miles ahead of me and be glad to give me advice. On the other hand, it was extremely competitive. It was every man for himself at, at the Yale system. You know, get promoted or get lost. Uh, so it's a little tougher, little tougher academic world, survival of the fittest. Here, you're loved. You grow, you build, you've made a commitment to an underserved area and you're appreciated. And I, I think it's, it's a very nice way of looking. There's two ways to skin the cat here. I think this is, a, this is the way to come to a, an underserved area and put down your roots, stay a long time, and meet other people elsewhere in the country that can mentor and maintain you and advise you. Great answer. We hope to recruit more people to the border as well. You've um, had a distinguished career mentoring the experts in gastroparesis around the country. How is mentoring surgeons different? Well, as you've mentioned, I've been to a few universities, and each one I had uh, the, 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 the good luck in a way, and also I worked at it uh, in, in nurturing a very good relationship with surgeons, particularly at uh, University of Virginia with Bruce Shermer, who went on to become the program director there, uh, Jamie Foster at, at, uh, at Kansas, and luckily able to meet you here, Brian, and, and other surgeons uh, that have sort of been part of those teams. I, I think the biggest thing I've found in getting to know a surgeon and working with them closely is initially mutual respect. You have your definite area of expertise, I have mine. We're going to merge together in this research world, which involve patients, we're not, we're not dissecting animals here. We're evolving into a research relationship, collaboration, where patients come in and where there may be discussion about styles, directions, care, philosophies. So it's best to be very slow and let the merger evolve. Get to know each other. Mutual respect is key. Mutual respect, we've got an expert I'm lucky to have here. I can send my family to him, they're going to do well. When we collaborate, there may be some sort of little initial issues. We may not agree on everything as we get very up close and personal and discuss some things. But over time, you learn to sort of compromise, work with the punches, flow with the, go with the flow, and you try to maximize each other's skills. And most of all, you get to know each other, respect each other as a person, as well as professionally. And so it becomes a, you know, what else can I do for you kind of relationship. We're not just trying to crank out papers and get your name on a few more of those. those that's early. Later, as a maturing relationship, you want to know about their career, you want to appreciate how they can help you, and they help your patients. By having this inside relationship with a great surgeon, you can facilitate patient care in your own practice and in the community. By, by, by being able to know someone who can take care of that problem, or he knows someone who will take care of it. So uh, I, I think it's been a, a great relationship. Uh, what I've learned most is when I go to the operating room, tread gently and make sure I know uh, what music the surgeon likes the best. I have to learn to make sure I understand those, those little, little, little idiosyncrasies. You've really grown your mentorship and your incredible career in being division chief in multiple locations and moving on to become founding chair of medicine here and start a gastroenterology fellowship. Did that evolve naturally or did you have a plan that eventually resulted in leadership as chair? No, I, I, I think we have different personalities. When I was coming up through the Yale system, uh, I got the bug, I got the academic bug. You know, these guys are doing it. I can do it just as well, maybe better. I'm going to move on and try to be a leader. I want to be a division chief. But you need support, 
openings that come available and people to support your application and, and sort of evolve you in that direction. So I don't think everyone needs to sort of aspire to be division chief and chair of medicine and all that stuff. But I think you do want to have a goal that's driving you to some degree that you want to evolve up, in your case, to a program director, probably being discussed around the country as an up and rising star for uh, an associate chief at a major surgery program or maybe a chairman, head of research, many other titles. So it's a little bit like a football coach. I mean, some coaches want to go up from being the offensive coordinator uh, to being the head coach and so on. Others are happy, you know, running the quarterbacks or the field goal kickers or whatever else and being on a great team. So it does take effort, family commitment. Growing means moving and that uproots some people, schools, children, family. So it's individual, but I, I think if you really have that, that energy and effort, you feel you can control the game better by being chief by understanding the, the plan for your department and playing a major role in molding that plan and not just being a victim of sort of decision making that you may not always agree on. But don't rush it, okay, don't rush it. There's no magic to be a chief by 40 or something. I thought I had to be. I was a bit over aggressive in retrospect. Let it come to you, grow and develop the skills and tools, maybe the maturity to work with people Writing papers, publishing papers, giving talks, being all over the country, that's one thing. Talking to faculty, nurturing them, understanding them, working with other chairs, working with deans, learning about finances. Don't rush that. You may want to take extra courses to prepare yourself for administration. And not everyone needs to go into that because when you go into it, deep into it, I had an offer to become a dean. I looked at that five, five times because when I went there, Gone are my clinical encounters every day. Gone is my grant. And after four or five years, which is the half-life of a dean, they'll spit you out. And you'll, they'll say, well, we're going a different direction. And you say, well, gee, I've just lost my grant. I've lost my clinical skills to some degree. I'm not a national speaker anymore. I gave up a lot for that little title in a bigger office. Be careful. What got you here was your clinical acumen, your great clinical skills, your great availability and consultancy strengths and your research goals. Uh, be careful you don't give up too much as you go ahead. Stay with what got you there as well. That's what people know you for and that's what you want to have as you go out, a legacy. Probably more lasting than I built a few buildings and uh, recruited a few extra people. So, two sides of that coin, Brian. You've really been an incredible pioneer in the entire evolution from the starting phase of the gastric electrical stimulator all the way through what you describe as the cure for gastroparesis, which is the combination of the gastric stimulator simultaneously with surgical pyloroplasty. Can you discuss a little bit how you deal with constructive criticism yep. in the evolution of this technique through what we're finding evidence for is the cure for gastroparesis? The main principle here is stay in the game. Okay, I did 200 of these almost at Kansas. We could argue we were doing it excessively. I didn't think we were, we got the right patients, but we weren't turning the ship around. We were getting 50% improvement. And after a while, it just became clear to me, we can do better. So we dug into why and how does neurostimulation really work? We were sold a certain bill of goods by Medtronic, well-meaning people, but their device was gonna revolutionize everyone's stomach uh, make it squeeze better, make the electrical rhythm wonderful, resurrect you. It didn't. But it did have a unique pathway to the brain. It massaged the muscle and the nerves, and an afferent pathway went to the brain and helped your nausea center, your chemoreceptor trigger zone. It's a great antiemetic. So I stayed in the game and suffered through some double-blind trials that weren't that spectacular criticism. The Mayo Clinic said, you know, we, we banned that device here. It's probably rubbish. Yeah, I know guys talked about me behind closed doors, but I kept my head up because I'm in the game trying to advance it. You can't advance it by just sort of listening to talk radio shows. You know, if you want to be a sports enthusiast, play the game. 
So I, I'm in the game, and I came to the conclusion that there's something else better. So we found that gastric emptying had to be improved, and we went to people like Dr. Davis and began doing pyloroplasties. And it's really the pyloric revolution in the last five to ten years that's changed the game of gastroparesis. We've moved from the antrum in the body of the stomach to understanding from biopsies obtained at surgery, only at surgery, that the pylorus has no interstitial cells or cajal. It's full of fibrosis. It's got weak compliance. It has to be opened. And voila, we now have gastric emptying 70% of the time it's normalized. I have some people even with dumping syndrome. A little emodium for diarrhea is a, a parking ticket compared to the vomiting and torture of gastroparesis. So it was staying in the game, being open to change. There had to be more. Let's go to the pylorus. Let's go to the next step. It's not a criticism of you wasted five or six years of your life putting it your cards and uh, or everything in that basket of neurostimulation. We had to be in the game to see the patients. Patients taught us. Dr. McCann, I'm not as good as I thought I'd be. I th we've spent $30,000 here, trusted you. I'm not, my wife's not as good as I hoped. We had to do better. And it forced us to look at other pathology. And thanks to creative surgeons like yourself, we had access to tissue. If you weren't in the game, you wouldn't be doing it. You've got to be toiling to finally reap the benefits. And it's, you've got to look at it that way. Um, I love that answer, Dr. McCallum. And it really shows how you brought your critics together because now you have built collaborations with the Mayo right. that was critical of your device. Right. And now we're feeding them tissue where you're becoming the leader in the science behind gasparesis by intrasurgical biopsies that are feeding the Mayo Clinic. They're in the basic science department. Can you talk a little bit about taking those people that are critical and building collaborations across institutions? Well, what you learn in academics too is that, uh, you know, uh, you end up um, uh, being in bed with different people. <laughs> so, you know, over time, uh, it is, it facilitates your career and their career to maximize your goals. So when you look around the country, you find out who's the leader in these fields and you're meeting them at meetings, you're rubbing elbows at posters, you know, behind their back to say, you know, that goddamn McCallum, what do you really know? But for the, for the day you meet and the things you do, you can offer them extra, extra tissue, extra things they can't do. So what's the, what's the harm in collaborating? So one is that, but we were forced together. So we became part of what's called the NIH Gastroparesis Consortium. We competed. 20 places sent in grants to the NIH 12 years ago. And we got in the top six and we were accepted. But the Mayo Clinic actually did not send an application in or maybe were not accepted. But their pathologists were asked to join us um, as kind of a, an addendum. Uh, they, they were kind of a consultancy group that were asked to join us. So we sat at the same table, had breakfast and stayed a, a day or two in the NIH, shook hands and got to know each other. And the NIH said, you know, you will collaborate as well, by the way. We're here to use the taxpayers' money to help patients overcome gastroparesis. The public's paying for this. You're going to collaborate. And so we began to understand the importance of that. Respect, we know our fields. We know sort of the line where you may not go over it. We don't openly criticize. We may have innuendo discussions about the fact we don't always agree, they don't get tissue. Unlike your sir, you Brian, their surgeons are frightened. They're frightened to take antral biopsies during surgeries, frightened to take a divot out of the pylorus. Only obesity patients can you have any op opportunity for surgery uh, encounters because you're bypassing their stomach. So they realized how innovative you were and we were. And so, you know, you make, you make a marriage. Uh, and, and the things in common are wonderful. You may not agree on much else, but in those areas, we're advancing the science and there's sort of, a, we want to all advance it. They're somewhat aggressive in doing their pathology. They can't do it without tissue. We want to say, well, we're on that paper about this mysterious macrophage stuff. We not, may not be the world's experts on M2 macrophages, but we go along with that ride and they go along because they get the tissue to make their careers better and get promoted. So it's the academic marriage that you have to live with.
not everything's perfect. You may not go out to dinner with them every night, but we are advancing science by having commonalities in areas of agreement. Fantastic answer. And to speak of that marriage, I'm very privileged to be joint appointed in internal medicine and to be teaching in the Department of Gastroenterology. One of your, your famous quotes when you first came here as chair is you'd say, <laughs> you said you'd make me so busy with surgery that I would forget all about endoscopy. To finish this interview, could you talk a little bit about the need to have surgeons continue to innovate in endoscopy in collaboration with gastroenterologists? Absolutely, Brian. Uh, I sort of am a bit more global. I'm, I'd, be sort of, I'd be very happy in Europe where we have the Digestive Disease Center. Patients are seen by the gastroenterologist, the surgeon, maybe the radiologist, interventional radiologist, and maybe the psychiatrist and nutritionist. I mean, we want everyone on the team. Here in America, there's been a bit of silo building. There's been a financial incentive, unfortunately, which cannot be avoided. Uh, GI fellows have careers. Uh, they want to grab as much of the action as they can. We have advanced endoscopy now, which everyone Everyone seems to have that goal whenever I talk to them. But what we have in a surgical presence is, is team building. You may take the lead on certain new procedures, which cannot be done effectively or safely by a gastroenterologist. We want that so-called backup surgeon. In some cases, he may be the first person doing it, and we're the backup GI guys, because after the game's over, we've got to take care of the patients for the next weeks, months, and years and surgeons do well for those first six or eight weeks, but may not want to look after patients forever and learn about the follow-up of the complications and long-term effects of a, of a procedure. And knowing you've got a person next door in the endoscopy suite or one phone call away is key. And seeing his residents learn about GI mentality, again on rounds, you come in a little different direction than we do. But there's so much commonality uh, among us. And when you go into practice, the first person I'd want to know in, you know, Missoula, Montana, who's my surgeon? Who am I going to call tonight? And the patient comes in with acute abdominal pain on Saturday night. Who can I call? Who can I rely on? I'm going to learn about my surgeon. I want to know how to collaborate and work with him. And endoscopy is key in, in working together. And particularly as we advance the field, endoscopic polaromyotomy. There's no one that's been preordained to lead that field we'd be happy to have a surgeon lead that field. I'm going to work the patient up. I'm going to get the patient totally prepared, uh, totally ready and uh, blessed to move ahead to an endoscopic pleuromotomy maybe in the future. Um, the, 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 therefore, we want to trust each other and know that teaching surgeons is not going to decrease the volume of our careers here. We're, we're not decreasing financial incomes. There's plenty to go around more than plenty, but we want well-trained surgeons and gastroenterologists that can understand their goals and their limitations. And in some centers, GI may take a lead, some center surgery may take a lead, but a, a communal relationship, patients like that, patients like that feeling that your surgeon's your right-hand man, we come to the bedside, we're all on the same team. That's key. Dr. McCallum, it's been a real privilege having you as my formal academic mentor for the last eight, year, eight years. Thank you very much for this interview. We're sure to have a great impact with up and coming surgical academics that are, are looking at pursuing a, a career in academics. Thank you so much. Brian, it's a pleasure to say to our listeners, uh, Brian's a great example of commitment, time, staying the course, growing, evolving, networking, going around the country, going to the meetings and making the effort and uh, it's a privilege to be uh, part of his mentoring team. Thanks again.